So today, derivative, derivatives, financial weapons of mass destruction. Now the expression financial, financialized weapons or weapons of financial mass destruction comes from Warren Buffett and it was included in a um, chairman's letter to shareholders at the time. Um, and it was written prior to the global financial, uh, the global financial crisis when Buffett identified the potential risk that exists within derivatives. And I just think it's a quite a snappy title is that derivatives are seen in many places as being responsible for contributing towards the Great Recession and the collapse of the global economy in 2007 and 2008. But we'll talk about those particular derivatives in another session. What we need to talk about here is derivatives in more general sense, in more general sense, in order for us to be able to understand more readily what we're talking about when we talk about derivatives. Because I understand that they're quite, I appreciate that they're quite complex, um, and they are. You know, and it, I will outline to you the most simple forms of derivatives, but there are more derivatives that are many, many, many more times more complex than the ones that we're going to talk about today. As an example, is that you can trade on um, futures of volatility, you can trade on options of volatility as well, um, volatility of, of stock and share markets. Um, and, you know, when you're starting to deal that, is that you really are starting to trade upon. Um, intangibles, <clears throat> intangibles and abstracts that act within the market, which undermines or underscores my lecture that I gave you a couple of weeks back or a week back or whatever, the last day's lectures that we did when I talked about intangibilities in the markets. And you'll start to be getting a sense now <clears throat> that what's written about in terms of business and markets and firms and so on and so forth within a lot of the what I would describe as being normative or functional textbooks is challengeable and it's challengeable in this the way that we, we started to do it because empirically is a lot of the views that are held by people that make comments about business don't bear up to scrutiny okay um, is that models that we've developed as a consequence of say dynamic general stochastic general equilibrium models where economies tend towards equilibrium suppose that there are certain things that are in place too that firms are profit maximizers that these that, that, and, and, and a number of different axioms are taking place but when you start to you start to look at them they start to the 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 the, the, the terms become more liquid there's less substance about them and this gives me this gives me rises to suggest that that capitalism as we've as we've seen it or as it's been perceived is undergoing a significant change it's still capitalism but capitalism in the way that it's framed is, is changing its nature changing its shape away from sort of like the idea of you take commodities and you sell them in order to get a profit and then reinvest back into productive capacity to create more profit and so on and so on and so forth as that we've seen over uh, over some of the lectures is that profit is only one variable but has less impact upon say share prices or perceptions of firms and so on and so forth and as a consequence of that the very notion of value and profitability itself becomes intangible it becomes abstracted away from the norm becomes more liquid, difficult to touch, yeah? <clears throat> and derivatives are part of this process. So let's talk about what they are, what they're supposed to do. We'll talk about the growth of the derivative market and we'll understand the reinvention of banking and why derivatives become such a fundamental part of the financial system. So famously termed financial weapons of mass destruction by Warren Buffett, and that's concerns that were fueled by media stories that blame derivatives for the global financial crisis, specifically CDOs, which are referred to as, as collateralized debt obligations that fueled the subprime mortgage market, specifically in the US, but not exclusively in the US, it's worth saying, is that the, the UK had quite a big subprime 
housing market as well. <clears throat> but we'll talk more specifically about CDOs and subprime and all of that kind of stuff in a lecture that I'll do specifically about the global financial crisis, because I still think that the global financial crisis is important, even though it was occurred in 2008, 2000, 2007, 2009, and then the subsequent sovereign debt crisis, 2011, 2013, because of the conjuncture is that we've never really got over the global financial crisis is, is yet to be resolved. In fact, we're still trying to resolve it. And then COVID came along and then we made some of the inherent problems of the solutions to the global financial crisis even worse. So we do need to talk about it because it's, it's everything that's led up to our current conjuncture where we are now. So we'll talk about CDOs and credit default swaps as CDSs that add complexity and fragility to the financial system. But what are these derivatives that we're talking about? What are they supposed to do? Are they tools for risk management, hedging or chips for speculation and gambling? And the jury's out on that one. OK, I have a tendency to see it as being the latter, but I can see where that if you were ever to 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 um, um, see some of the videos that Robert Merton has produced and put onto YouTube, <clears throat> um, this is the same Merton from Black Skulls and Merton fame, is that Merton makes a very good case for derivatives. In fact, Merton would argue as much as that if derivatives are utilised properly is that there's no need for a third or for a public sector. He believes that you can finance pretty much anything through the use of derivatives. Now, I'm not sure I'd go that far. But within those two poles, there is a germ of truth, I suppose. And just looking at <coughs> this here is that this is a kind of like a graphic that illustrates the kind of innovations that occurred in the financial market over the last few years, from 1950s last to, to current, current trends. And we've seen growing percentage of UK US house ownership, growing occupational pension coverages, transformation of banks, which I'll talk about later on, reinvention of stock markets, new market players, investment banks, hedge funds and private equity and activist investors. And then innovation in wholesale and retail markets, and specifically we're talking about derivatives here. And I'll refer to, I think, securitization in this, this lecture as well, but I'll deal with securitization in more depth at a, uh, in subsequent lectures. And the economic and social impact that these innovations have had and we'll look at that or well we'll look at that in later lectures but more with our <coughs> with our with our beck hat on our Ulrich beck hat on and in the late, lecture later on today i'll talk about innovation more generally and, and um, what financial innovation is supposed to bring to to the party now i've shown you this before and it's just a series of lines and on a on a, on, a, on a graph without any um, axes on it. But um, it just, it's just a piece of work that I'm doing. And I, and I just wanted to just, I, I've got no conclusions about this, by the way, because I'm still working on trying to eke out some conclusions that come from this. But what I was struck by was the increases in prices of petrol currently. And I was also struck by the view that um, People within the petrol industry, in the oil industry, would say that there's, 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 in the in the media, you sort of like say, well, when the price of oil is down, low, why don't prices at the pump come down? And you know, what's the relationship between pump prices and so on and so forth? And I thought it was interesting, so I thought I'd do a bit of an investigation. So I've just started this work. I just started it really since I started this lecture series. But so what I've done on this graph is I've just balanced out some curves. To, to, to 100, if you like, or whatever number it is, it, it doesn't really matter because I'm not really interested in the maths of it. I'm just interested in the shapes of the curves and whether they correspond to each other and how they correspond to each other. And I've got three curves here. I've got price at the pump and I've got the wholesale price and then I've got the oil futures index. And that doesn't really tell us much, <clears throat> but if you just flatten them out a bit, is that there's a change in 2017, late 2017, between the relationship between the price at pump and the oil futures index. Now, I've got 
some questions that I want to ask about, not, I'm not asking you guys, these are questions that I'm asking myself about what's the relevance of all of these sorts of things, because where's the, well, oil firms, petrol firms say, well, they buy their fuel in advance. Well, actually they trade on futures that are only one month in advance of when they need it. So they're not buying fuel years into the future. It's, it's literally a month in advance. And similarly, what I'm also interested in is that how does the price of the derivatives impact the price at the pump? And I have a view that if traders lose money on their trading contracts, on their derivative contracts, is that they then are forced to buy the money, buy their oil, subsequently their petrol, on the wholesale markets which means that opportunities arise for derivative traders who lose money on, contr on derivative contracts. Now, oil firms will trade derivative contracts, futures contracts, and I'll come on to what futures contracts are in a minute. But if they lose money, then they need to make money back. And one way that they can make money back is by increasing the price of the pump. In other words, the consumer, us, who buys petrol at the pump are therefore the hedge for derivative traders and commodity traders more generally, which changes the relationship in practice to what it's supposed to be in theory. Now there is a subsequent change in 2017 where the price of the pump is much higher than oil futures index, uh, the oil futures index, which indicates that probably people are losing money on their oil contracts. And that, as a consequence, is where you start to see the wholesale price going up as well. Which, what, where, where's the causal relationship between these? As I say, this is just a work that's in practice. I've got no idea. But if the original plan or the original theory is that prices um, on the oil futures contracts should be lower than the wholesale price, then that green line should be below the. Um, should be below the, 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 the red line, and it just isn't. So there's something going on there that I don't understand. And if I find out before the end of this lecture series, I'll let you know. But just to give you an idea is that I'm interested here in terms of like how do derivatives prices impact the prices that people pay at market? And I'll leave you with that thought at the end, but I'll give you a different example. So derivatives seen as an efficient way or an effective way of managing volatility and risk. Are they different to insurances therefore? Because aren't insurances designed to do exactly the same thing? But a derivative is a contract that derives or obtains its value from some other market or asset, which we refer to as the underlying. And it must be tied to the reference asset or, link, or uh, the reference asset or an income flow. An insurance is a contract that provides financial restitution when a loss making event occurs. So there is a substantial difference between the two. However, if you comply, combine them both, then you've got effectively, in theory at least, a good way of managing risk. But we have to take into account our limitations on what we understand risk to mean now, because risk and uncertainty are different concepts, as we've talked about before. Um, Derivatives can be bought and sold on a whole array of different things. Stocks, baskets, baskets of stocks or indexes on stocks. It can be, they can be bought and sold on debt, money market instruments and rates, government and corporate bonds. They can be traded on currencies, commodities, indexes, just generally <clears throat> the weather, rainfall and temperatures and events and the, the, the risk of certain events happening, such as football matches um, and um, shipping catastrophes. So there's a huge array of them that can take part. But at, at its core, the derivative is a way of allocating or reallocating risk, okay? It's a shifting of risk to those that are prepared to undertake it. Whereas within the market, there are those that are very risk averse and there are those that are risk takers, pension funds on the one hand, hedge, hedge companies or private equity firms or investors on, on, on the other side of it. And the, the derivative allocates risk to those that are more happy to take it, okay? So it's seen as beneficial as excessive risk may limit continued trading or investment 
and so on and so forth. So you want to spread your risk. Allows the ability to hedge and manage your exposure to a particular risk. <clears throat> and they're also what's known as tenable. In other words, that you can hold them. And if they're holdable, then you can trade them. And they determine within the contracts themselves, current and future prices. So in some respects, is they're a little bit like monetary time machines. And the, the view is that this improves market efficiencies. Transaction costs are therefore suppressed and are lower because the risk has been taken out of the equations. And one way in which we can say that this is working is that if we look at the risk weighted averages for risk of banks over a period of time, so from 2013 down to 2019, we can see that the average risk that's being taken by international banks is going down. People say, well, this is as a consequence of the derivatives and the allocation of risk. <clears throat> and banks and bankers would argue as intermediaries in the market, they allocate capital efficiently and they allocate on the basis of those to those people or institutions that are prepared to take on the highest levels of risk, which makes the market efficient. Tends towards general equilibrium. There's a difficult kind of like construct that we're sort of putting together here. But at the end of the day is that derivatives are part of the mechanism, part of the financial instruments that make markets efficient. OK, and as a consequence of that it fits in and is supported very much by the underlying economic theory of general equilibrium and market efficiencies. Through the management allocation of risk. I'm just going through some of your points. Prices at pump means at the gas station. Yeah, it does. I think the price at the pump is the cost of extraction, whereas the wholesale price is the price at the station. Well, not really, because the price at the pump should take into account the cost of extraction too, because it's down the line. Um, not, not necessarily. Wholesale price could be how much the companies who supply fuel uh, to us pay to buy to supply fuel to us pay to buy it as a stock which might well explain why the wholesale price is lower than the price of the pump and the wholesale price would be lower than the price of the pump otherwise there'd be no point being in business but the graph didn't show um did show that relationship between the two but what i'm interested in is that what what the impact of the derivatives and people making and losing money on the derivatives is so what are derivative prices they are the prices that people pay on the contracts and we'll come on to that in a minute when we talk about contracts so who might use derivatives derivatives are um broadly speaking split into four different groups Hedges, arbitrages, speculators, and the middlemen. Hedges produce and consume the underlying, i.e. the asset of which the derivative is based upon. They may have exposure to price fluctuation in that market and they use derivatives to protect themselves by passing the risk on to other parties. This is the, 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 the rationale behind people taking out futures contracts and hedging the prices. In other words, we'll buy oil in the future or whatever product commodities in the future because we can therefore we can manage the price we can we we remove the uncertainty away from the price which means that we can plan a lot better which kind of like it's not what oil traders are doing and oil companies are doing because they're only trading in about a month in advance there's all more which indicates it's more about the contract rather than anything else so as an example kellogg's could take out a futures contract with a corn producer to exchange a certain amount of corn at a specific agreed price, and both are hedges. Well, now I'll just turn that off. I'll be back in a minute. So it's a common type of hedging activity and related to utilities, energy and currencies. Next up, arbitrages. Arbitrage is a particular kind of phraseology that exists within financial 
um, the financial world. Arbitrage is the practice of taking advantage of price differences. Now, this belies the fact that actually this shouldn't occur in our framework of economics because everybody's got perfect information. We've all got perfect information, then price differences can't occur because price contains all the information that you need. However, um, there could be price differences between different markets. It's a trade that profits by exploiting profit, profit price differentials. The theory suggests that arbitrage opportunities exist because of market imperfections. So there's a possibility of risk-free profit at zero cost. <clears throat> arbitrage is possible when the same asset doesn't try trade at the same price in all markets. Two assets with identical cash flows and risks don't trade at the same price or an asset with a known future price does not to trade, trade today at its discounted future price. All of which give you price differentials, which allows you to arbitrage in the market and engage in a derivative contract in order to manage that risk. In practical terms, however, this is only possible with securities and financial products that are dis traded digitally because of the fact that the arbitrage or the act of trading on the arbitrage removes the price differential and the prices coalesce. So speed is of an essence that's here, which gives you rise to something which is referred to or has been referred to as flash trading. Flash trading is very controversial and it's a practice where groups of individuals with access to sophisticated technology can view orders before the entire market. And we are literally talking about seconds or actually percentages of seconds, hundreds of seconds. As an example, people will, firms will invest in um, communication links, IT links through a pipe and try to make the pipe shorter so that you're actually, it takes less time to get that extra 400 yards or whatever it is down the pipeline so that <clears throat> you can exploit that 400 yards worth of time difference. So literally it's microseconds that, that, that will allow you to do it. But Technology allows the sophisticated trading of those kinds of those kinds of technologies. 2009, um, it was proposed to eliminate flash trading, although the rules were never passed. Um, but subsequent waves of criticism after several market events, flash trading has been voluntarily discontinued by most of the exchanges, though it is still offered in some exchanges. So it still exists. And just to give you an idea about what a market collapse might look like in 2010, May the 6th, 2010, there was a substantial flash crash in the market. Um, and <laughs> this, isn't, this is different to algorithmic trading on indexes. This is just people trading on the arbitrage in time in order to be able to make profits. But conversely, it can go the other way as well. OK, so just an example of it, just to make you aware of flash crashes or flash trading is that um, the guy that wrote The Big Short, he also wrote a, a the subsequent book was called um, Flash Boys, which is about flash trading. So that's arbitrages trying to exploit price differentials and the ultimate price differential traders are flash traders where they exist. Next is speculators. Those that seek, to, that seek exposure to risk without, with the aim of making a profit. Um, this is not about owning the actual commodity or the asset that's being traded. This is just simply about making profit. Remember, investors seek yields <clears throat> and will seek to maximize their yields. Financial speculation can involve trading and the short selling of so stocks and all sorts of different things, bonds, commodities, anything of value. And it's attempt to exploit the price fluctuation between the asset, the derivative and the underlying itself. <clears throat> and I think that this is where oil and petrol trading is particularly relevant, although that's my view. I haven't proven it yet. I'll keep going. Textbook in textbooks, investors and speculators are seen to be different, but in practice, it's the same thing. Because of the nature of the investment over the short term, it's speculation in order to make yields. In practice, it's the same thing as well at all, is if you're investing in a long-term something, you probably wouldn't be engaging in derivative contracts. In most markets, the number of speculators is much higher than any other type of trade trader. 
and that's abundantly clear from what we've talked about you know all of the big <coughs> trading houses investment banks and so on and so forth are interested are interested in yield and as a consequence that they are speculators they're not investing in the underlying the underlying firms they're investing in markets where nothing new is produced and then finally the middlemen investment banks market makers brokers and tr uh, 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 trade derivatives in order to earn a fee or benefit from a spread so you could be acting for different clients and therefore you're charging a fee and therefore that's how you make your money that comes out of it that way so in other words you could say to well, we can get your corn cheaper than you're buying it kellogg's because we will undertake that on your behalf and we will charge you a fee pass the benefit the price differential onto their clients a market maker is either a firm or an individual that posts prices for buying and selling so a market maker is an individual firm an independent firm or part of a bank that will post price for corn or oil yeah and they buy and sell the various things but under, underneath that is that what they're doing is they're engaging in derivative trading in order to mitigate their risks Middlemen benefit from high activity and consequently will engage in hedging in order to minimize the risks to themselves. And that means that they might have to buy the underlying asset in order to be able to minimize the risk if their exposure is very high to say a shift in currency devaluations like the pound, then they will probably hedge that by buying other currencies or they'll make sure that if there is a growth in it, they've got access to a lot of pounds or they'll hold pounds. So it's a very complex, um, rate of exchanges that are going on and contracts that are ongoing in there in order to be able to balance out the risk but ultimately what's happening here is that people are attempting at least to minimize the risk to their own exposures okay is there a movie called the big short yes there is it's has anyone seen it Anyone see it? No? I'm biased. I think the book is much better. So read the book. I think it's in the library. <clears throat> By the looks of it, some of you are in AMBS and you're near the library, so you just pop along and borrow it. I'm not sure if it's online, I don't know. So that's derivatives before we get on to the actual kinds of contracts that exist as well. But to talk about the market, the market itself comprises of what's known as OTC contracts or over-the-counter contracts traded between two parties without going through an exchange. And that's the interesting thing about derivatives is that they don't go through an exchange, therefore they're very difficult to regulate, providing that they are lawful and that people adhere to the contracts, then all well and good. So there exists possibility of counterparty risk in other words, somebody pulls out of their contract without actually accepting their part of it, um, which might well undermine the trust in the entire system. But in reality, most contracts are fairly standard. And as we've already found out, is that those that are overly exposed will engage in further activity in order to mitigate their risks, their, their risk in the first place. There's been a push in order to be able to get OTCs into exchanges and clearing clear, clearing platforms. Um, exchange traded derivatives, specialist exchanges between the CME group and Eurex do exist. However, if we look at one of them, which is Eurex, is that you can see from this graph and this graph gives you the light blue, the dark blue and the green. And what we're really interested here is the green line because it's the green line that shows you the size of the number of contracts, but also it gives you an indication of the amount of liquidity, cash that's being engaged in contracts as well. So from 2015 through to end of 2018, is that we've seen a substantial drive in derivative trading through exchanges, formally through exchanges, but also off book exchanges as well i they just hold the contracts in, as a security for other people but there's been a dramatic shift in tr derivative trading it's just showing you that derivative trade is big market it's a big market so what 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 are they these contracts so there are four or five different groups okay 
Um, uh, there are more than this, but if you're really interested in this, then I suggest that you look at the book that I've posted online called Derivatives, and, and it will outline them all for you. Um, there's also this one, if you are dead interested in it and you want to buy a copy of something yourself, and that's called Derivatives for the Trading Floor. And it's by Boyle and McDougall. And there you go, there's a big thick book there of some 300 odd pages of derivative, different types of derivatives and how they're used. You don't need to know this, it's only if you're interested in it, but some of you will be, I know. People get very excited about derivatives in the hope that actually one day we'll be able to make money out of derivatives ourselves. Okay, um, so can middlemen earn interest if the individuals hold their contracts for a long period of time? Uh, it depends upon the nature of the contract, but usually they're time specific. Otherwise, there's no resettlement, you just go on forever. So forwards, forward contracts is an over-the-counter contract between two parties where payment takes place at a specified time in the future at today's predetermined price, which doesn't mean to say it's this price, it's just something that's been determined. So we agree to exchange something in the future at a particular price. Now, it's worth pointing out here is that if you are buying several tens of millions of barrels of oil, the last thing that you want is the flipping oil because then you've got a problem storing it. So it's the contract that's important. It's not necessarily the underlying asset itself. The theory suggests that the trading of the risk of it reduces the transaction costs, which actually keeps the price of oil stable. Hmm. Okay, but that's a future contract and that's the nature of it, okay? It's a kind of hedging. Its origins are in agricultural markets. It's old, so the notion of derivative contracts is not a new thing, it's an old concept, but nevertheless, there are more of them now, which is the, and the sophistication of them has changed a lot. So as an example, if you've got an uncertainty about your crop price, then you can trade it as a futures contract, which will give you sufficient return in a bad um, harvest in order for you to be able to continue on trading. That's kind of like the idea about it. An exchange listed contract to buy and sell an asset on or before a specific date or time and price, because don't forget is that these things are tenable, which means that if they're listed on an exchange, they could be traded. People will change the contracts and leave them as a secondary market on derivative contracts. <coughs> um, standardized futures contracts are issued by futures exchanges, um, which makes them more tradable because everybody knows that the terms of the contract are the same. Okay, so you've got some kind of like similarity in there moving away from the uh, uh, over the counter um, contract, which tend to be standardized but don't need to be. It could be different. So futures become a tool of speculation. Futures remain the preserve of commodities businesses specifically because you can trade them. That's the speculation that comes into it. New information, sentiment and all the rest of it. New narratives can make um, derivatives very tradable. Um, and they were the reserve of commodity businesses, but were extended in 1970s is that you got a lot of currency trading. And then in 1980s, stock trading or equities, stocks. So futures trading, commodities, currency. In fact, I would argue, I think, I think I've got a chart a bit later on that shows that the majority of futures trading is done on currency markets now. <clears throat> Options, very much like futures, but with a degree of choice built into it. So you get the option as to whether or not you want to exercise the right that's actually been enshrined in the contract. So you can either buy or sell, but at a particular point in the future, or you can decline and just pay a fee. Yeah. That if the contract is running against you, is that you might set, decide to settle it just by paying a penalty fee to whoever the contract is with. So the buyer of a call option, there's a different two types here. There's calls and puts. The call, buyer of a call option is the right, but not the obligation to buy an agreed quantity of a particular asset from the seller at a set date. 
the buyer of a put option as the right, but not an obligation to sell. So it's just the difference between the two sides of the, so within every contract, there's gonna be somebody who is on an option and somebody who is on a put, because you need a buyer and a seller. And you can agree, or both parties can agree not to go through with the trade, but at the payment of a penalty, which will go to the other person that the contract was going to be in there. <clears throat> and you would exchange that, or that you would call in your rights of, of that, um, depending on how the, the market trade was going. So back to my oil trading example, is that if your options contracts were running against you, is that you might decide to pay the penalties, which means that you would lose less money than if you were actually going to deliver on the options contract but then the firm itself whereas it's oil firms that are engaging in options contracts would lose money so they need some way of making money back on failing contracts and my argument here is that they can hedge that through payment at the um, payment at the pump they use the consumer as a hedge and that would be the same for things like um uh, electricity prices as well because they'd be traded on options contracts there's also warrants similar to an option but it's typically issued by a company on its own stock okay so you can either buy or sell new stock new stock is issued which causes a, di a dilution to common stockholders in order to be able to mitigate that you might do it under a warrant contract because then you've got a chance of buying and selling under agreed terms Swaps, this is where we start to get more and more complex here now. So you again, you don't need to understand these because we're not going to do swaps. We're not going to engage in swapping contracts or anything like that. You just need to understand the principles of the innovations that are in there. If you really are interested in it, then go away and do some research on it. Start with Investopedia and then go on to the kind of like books that I've, I've, I've shown you earlier on today and the one that I've listed online. Swaps are over-the-counter derivatives in which counterparties exchange cash flows um, with others. So it can be similar cash flows or similar instruments with other people that are, uh, that are signatories to the contract. Effectively, they're bets between two parties. So as an example, you can have a swap on interest rates. So if one person is paying a variable rate and they expect the rates to go up, and another may have a fixed rate, but they expect them to go down, they can literally swap them under a contract and you swap the modes of payment. Credit default swaps, which were big money during the course of the global financial crisis, which we'll hear about later on in another lecture, are forms of insurance because it's a swap of the risk of default at now or at different times in the future. So one party pays a premium to another who promises to cover the losses in the event of a default. Yeah, the higher the premium, the riskier the company. And that's worth bearing in mind is because credit default swaps were offered on a lot of the collateralized debt obligations contracts, which were based upon mortgages, subprime mortgages. In other words, we took out insurance contracts against the failure of mortgage contracts. CDS contracts, because they are pay a premium, they have a cash flow, therefore are tradable and are open to speculative activity. In other words, they can be traded on exchanges. So that swaps. So they're the basic, the basic kinds: forwards, futures, options, swaps. And there are different bits that are in there, and they become more abstract depending on the abstract nature of the things that you're actually trading under uh, the underlying. Um, that you're trading as well. Does it mean that swaps is a risk-free profit-making method? Well, in theory, it might well be, yeah. Um, is that a lot of derivative trading is zero-sum game. So if I win, you lose. But in practice, is there anything that's risk-free? Uh, in theory, the insurances, as an example, like the CDS swaps were supposed to be risk-free because they were levied against derivatives that were not very risky but then they failed and that meant that the people who had underwritten the insurance contracts or had underwritten the cds contracts lost out big style tens of billions of dollars so in theory they're supposed to be risk-free because that's the nature of derivatives contracts derivative trading in practice that might not be the case 
because the real world is uncertain, not just risky. Size of the derivative market, we've already talked about this, about $1.2 quadrillion, which is a staggering number. However, it's not the real number, is it? We just did that to sort of make it sound a bit more exciting. You need to dis the, the, we need to distinguish between notional and the gross value of the contracts themselves. So the value of the underlying assets. So you take away the, 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 the notional value and then subtract away from the gross value, which gives you the kind of like the real value of the, the contract and the, which is referred to as the gross value. So the gross value of the contract stands at around about $15.5 trillion, which is considerably less, less than the quadrillion, <clears throat> 1.2 quadrillion, but nevertheless is much more manageable. So there's huge amounts of numbers floating around in terms of numbers of contracts and so on and so forth, but the actual gross value of those contracts is much, much smaller than, than, than the, the, the notional value. Still big numbers, however, and we are talking, it's only 15.5, but it's $15.5 trillion, which is more than the entire economy of China. Just to put it into a perspective. Observable trends is that derivatives are cheap because you don't need to own, actually own the underlying. So you don't need to actually own oil in order to be able to trade oil. Investors are interested in yields, remember? Size of the market, it's huge and it's growing. Rapid growth since 2000 and then a slowdown in 2008 as a consequence of regulation. Nature of the market is that the OTC market is the biggest size of it. Non-standard standard contracts are brokered by banks and offer, uh, often just over the phone and the contracts drawn up later on. Dominated by currency trades and insurances, i.e. credit default swaps, is an important part of the market. And it gives you an indication there about the size of the market in that the gross value or the gross market value and gross credit exposure is just seen as seen an uptick in 2020. Nowhere near the size of the market as it was back in 2011, 2012. There's been a slowdown, probably as a consequence of regulation, but as regulation is now being eased a little bit, mainly as a con consequence of um, the, the Trump administration, um, is that um, derivative contracts have started to pick up. But uh, if you look at the little graph that's on the right, is it's the pink, pinky red bits, which are the FX parts of the, of the columns. And they show you that that's currency trading, that's foreign exchange trading, which is by far and away the largest bit of it. Okay. So let's take a short break, 10 minutes, in order for us to um, powder your nose. I'll go and get a cup of coffee. And then we'll be back and we'll talk about how banking, shifts in banking has contributed to the shift in um, derivative trading. See you in a bit. <laughs> 
Welcome back. <coughs> um, I don't think you can make profit risk free. You can, it doesn't have to be scamming. Um, but there's always an element of risk that's in there. And I guess that the notion of risk free profit is that what risk are you prepared to stand? Yeah. So there are always alternative strategies to mitigating people's risk, hedging, arbitrage, and so on and so on and so on and so forth. Um, I mean, hedge funds themselves may well <coughs> invest in a particular stock, but may also short another particular stock. And it's a way about your strategies of investing that would be um, that would mitigate the levels of risk. But within derivative trading, derivative trading is seen as being a zero sum game. So there's always an element of risk. Um, I think it might be fair to say is that you can make more profit the higher the levels of risk, but also you've got more chance of getting burned if that's the case too. What's the spread? Um, adequately explained by Joe there. Um, and also by Harry, is that the spread is just is just the differential between two 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 numbers really. So <clears throat> banks as intermediaries would pay a rate of interest on savings, but then would also claim a rate of interest on loans. And there's a spread between the two interest rates. So it's just the difference between two interest rates. That's what's known as a spread. So let's talk about. Banks, and I've referred to this before in that investment banks or banks more generally shifted their mode of operation. And um, shifting the growth of the derivative markets. I'm just watching what Harry's doing up there. It looks like he's got some vitus stamps. You're all right, mate. Shall we wait for you? Oh, you've lost your pencil. Is that it? Right. Got it now. Good. Excellent. Well done. All right. So um, <clears throat> to understand the growth of uh, derivative markets and the rise of securitization, I'll talk about securitization in a minute. We need to look at our banks reinventing themselves. And in the old business model, investment banks provided corporate services, mergers and acquisitions advice, um, share issues and um, they derive fees. So they got a fee and that's how the, the bank would make its, its, its money, specifically as being middlemen. In the newer business models, investment banks become financial engineers and proprietary traders on their own account in the wholesale market. Now the difference here is rather than charging fees, and passing the gain of the trades on to clients is that now banks would act in their own interests in order to generate additional profits through their own trades rather than just through fees. And the significance of this is that banks have got access to much, much higher levels of leverage. So that a bank that might invest a million dollars of its own capital could leverage that trade up to 50 to 100, probably not as high as that, but certainly 50, 50 million dollars worth of trading and would be able to therefore claim the profits for themselves once they've discharged their loan obligations to somebody else. So it's significant in that banks now, banks can operate in their own interests, but there's also an, an, an a tension that exists between the bank operating in its own interests, which may be to the detriment of their clients. Because if you're investing $50 million in a share market, as an example, you could shift the share price, which technically not able to do, but in practice it's possible, which might be to the detriment of the corporation or somebody else that's bought different shares in the same sector and so on and so forth. So there exists tensions between the two. But conglomerates like Deutsche Bank, <coughs> Barclays and Citi shifted quite fundamentally into proprietary trading 
and also into mass marketing, marketing to the likes of you and me. Market analysts understand that large financial institutions pur purposely obfuscate details on proprietary versus non-proprietary trading. Now, purposely, and I've used that word deliberately because it's not in the best interest of the banks to let anybody else know what they're trading in because they'd be trading in substantial amounts of money, which can shift markets, perceptions of markets, and so on and so forth, particularly if they're trading on like an arbitrage basis or even on a futures basis. So the, the activities of the banks are not necessarily open to um, scrutiny. Now, you might well argue, well, what about the auditors and the accountants that are supposed to be scrutinising it? Well, there are ways and means of, of getting around that in that banks would set up wholly owned companies referred to as special interest vehicles that are off the balance sheet that would deal with some of these activities. And in that way, the activities of the bank look clear and are open to the auditors. The activities of a special interest vehicle would be audited separately and not necessarily would the two be connected with each other. Particularly if what you do is that you end up with long chains of special interest vehicles that work in hand in glove with each other. And that was, that's, that was not, it's less so now, but it's, it, that has happened in the past where you've maybe got three or four handling different parts of contracts and passing them around to each other. But all four of them would be wholly owned by the parent company and investment bank. And it, in effect, it obscures the activities and promotes a lot of self-interest, corporate self-interest. And this is particularly um, post the general uh, the, the the global financial crisis. This was <clears throat> this was effectively reduced down because of increased levels of regulation. In that the there was a more of a requirement for transparent information. Um, the links between banks and special interest vehicles needed to be more clearly identified and links between the marketing end of the business or the retail end of the business and the investment end of the biz business needed to be <clears throat> um, uh, limited at best or foreclosed. Um, however, since December 2013, I beg your pardon, in December 2013, this was enshrined in the Volcker Rule, but in June 2020, is that the Volcker rule has been restricted or the restrictions have been loosened, which allows banks to go back into activities that have proven to be very successful in the past in allowing the bank to act more as a, a, um, uh, a conglomerate and utilize special interest vehicles, which allows more obfuscation of what's going on. And just to give you an idea, is that we're dealing with a significant part of the economic sector. In, uh, in the United States, the banking or the finance, insurance, real estate, rental and leasing, which is known as the fire sector, which includes banks, is um, about 22.3% of American GDP, which is significant. Remembering that American GDP is about 23 trillion, 22% of that or 20% of that quarter of that is going to be 5 trillion plus change. So it's a big sector. And the opportunities, therefore, in this less than transparent environment. Obviously, if I've moved the slides on for you so you can see it. Um, what do we mean by proprietary trading? It just means trading on a proprietary basis. I am the proprietor, we are the proprietors, we are trading on our own interests. Does that make sense, Artem? Yeah. So it's big business in the US. And gross value added by the, the finance and insurance sectors in the UK from 1990 to 2021, millions of GDP is a uh, million dollars GDP is also 
substantial in real terms. What would that be? 120 million, so about the same. In fact, a little bit more in terms of percentage than it is in America as well. So it's both have declined from the high point of 2007, 2008, but not back to the levels that we've seen in the 1990s, early 1980s, is that they are still high and very elevated. And we'll talk about that in a, another lecture um, when we talk about um, central bank policy, monetary policy and um, quantitative easing. There's, there's an argument to suggest that with the central banks of the world pumping more and more liquidity into the economy in order to be able to protect the economy is that effectively what they've done is they protect financial markets rather than the underlying economy itself. But the point that I'm just making is that <clears throat> with the finance sector being such a large part of advanced economies and those players within that market working for their own interests is that they have huge opportunities to raise profits which may well be detrimental to other players within the market. In other words, the rest of the economy. And then we can talk about another shift in banking practice, which is as mass marketers, in that retail banks act as intermediaries between depositors and borrowers, with the interest spread rates being the main source of income, which we talked about earlier on. But now retail banks become mass marketers and they generate fees or performance related pay based upon what products that you can sell to clients and customers. In fact, there's a core celebre case that went before the American Senate probably two years ago. It was brought to the attention of Elizabeth Warren by Wells Fargo Bank, opened up a series of accounts for all of their account holders. And the account holders didn't know they'd got the new accounts. And it was done under a kind of like a byword or a buzzword within the uh, within the industry itself is that eight is great. So every client is to have eight accounts. But what the client or what the, the, the individuals didn't know is that they were being charged for those accounts. But alongside that, there's a commensurate amount of pressure that goes into hard selling new accounts to existing account holders. And that's what we mean by mass marketing. And you'll, <clears throat> you'll experience this as you become more valuable to the banking industry yourself, where well, you already are because of the fact that you've now taken out financing loans in order to fund your qualifications, is that you, you're now in the system and they will continue to drip feed and tailor financial products to you over the course of your working life, um, to the extent that we receive, I don't know, 10 to 20 different approaches from banks on a weekly basis. They all go in the bin, but you know, some people will pick them up, won't they? And I think that <clears throat> in one of the earlier lectures, I, we talked about um, how the household has been financialized. And I may have referred to people that I've met in the course of my lectures and course of my travels that are hugely encumbered by massive amounts of personal debt, usually as a consequence of credit cards. Because you have a credit card that you spend up to your limit. And then the bank either increases your limit or somebody else sends you the opportunity to take out another credit card because you're now on the system and you're now perceived as being a good credit risk. And I've met people that have got in excess of 10 credit cards, all of which are maxed out. And they're using available credit on each credit card to pay off the other credit cards. Which is a... <clears throat> I mean, it's, in some respects, as you say, well, that's ridiculous. How stupid do you have to be to get yourself into that kind of mess? But trust me, it's not that difficult. And it's relatively common. And that means that the only way then you can gain more finance or more credit in order to be able to pay off your credit cards is to go to things like payday lenders and short term creditors where the interest rates on those loans can be up to 1500 percent 
because you're taking money out on the short term in order to warrant the short term is that the interest rates are eye-wateringly high. And of course, those that really are impacted most by those high levels of interest are those people that are the most vulnerable. So banks become mass marketeers where they make fees, selling things like mortgages, loans, pensions, <clears throat> mutual funds, uh, wealth management products, so on and so on and so on and so on. Interestingly, it's households, not firms, that account for more than 50% of borrowing in advanced economies. And in meanwhile, the process of securitization removes from balance sheets limits on what you could sell. So what does that mean? Simply put, securitization means the packaging up of debts and selling them to a different person so that you can continue to sell more stuff. So as an example, if I have 100, let's say, doesn't matter what the denomination of the 100 is, in my bank, which is used for mortgages, and Harry comes to the bank and says, I want a mortgage for 50, and we agree it, is that he takes them 50 and I've now got 50 left. And then Artem comes along and he takes another mortgage out for 50 and I get, well, that's it, I can't trade anymore. So what do I do is I take those two mortgages, I package them back together and I securitize them and sell them to Liam. And he gives me money back, which means that I can now actually originate more mortgages and can carry on. Now, I still make money is because what I do is that I'll handle the fees from Harry and from Artem and pass them on to Liam, but I will charge Liam a fee for the, as a management fee for doing that. And now my coffers are now full and I can continue to add more and more mortgages to my book. So I can now sell mortgages to Rowan for 50 and to Sam for 50, package them together, sell them to somebody else, let's say James, and now I've got two clients and I'm handling four mortgages, but I've increased my fee income. I've still got 100 of assets that are left in order to continue to sell more mortgages. So effectively, the limitations is not, or, or the limitation on my ability to lend is not limited by the capital that I actually own in the, that I have in the bank, which is contrary to a lot of theories on banking that says that your lending is limited to the amount of capital that you've got. But as we already found out in lecture four, I think it was, is that banks actually just create money supply by lending credit anyway. So it's kind of like a misnomer in the first place. But securitization is substantial, particularly at the time of the global financial crisis, as you can see from that graph on the right. And then it dropped 2018, 2019, and 2020. Not surprisingly, has slowed the market securitization down as households who borrow more than corporations, um, have had to look at their own security because of the potential risks in terms of longevity of employment and so on and so forth. But I think as we can expect that to pick up um, over the next two to three years. And the, if you look at um, originations in the United States, and how these processes of CD of, of securitization went on is that 2005, six and seven, you see the big one, the orange one that's on there. And the orange one is the CD, CDOs and CLOs, and that is securitization of mortgages. Interestingly, look, if you go along 2017, 2018, massive spike in mortgage securitization, but could have, Potentially, potentially could have been another spike in mortgage rate of default, but that's been headed off by the, um, by the pandemic and the Fed's commitment to ensuring that nobody gets made um, homeless during the course of the pandemic. How long that will last, uh, only time will tell. But that will give you an idea of the kind of like the things that have been securitized. So capital equipment, credit cards, auto it means cars, basically, student loans and then other. And quite frankly, I have no idea what's in other. <clears throat> but 
securitization is big business all over the globe because of the processes that I've outlined earlier on to you. And if we look at, if we go back to that and you see that the size of the mortgage securitizations declined in 1918, 1919, 2020 as a consequence of the uh, pandemic, but as the pandemic is perceived to have ended, and it hasn't ended, has it? We could argue that it's endemic now, perhaps not a pandemic, but it's certainly endemic. In other words, we're learning to live with COVID, which is why you guys are sat in public spaces wearing face masks. Um, but if you look at the amount of mortgage related securities that were issued in 2020, is that you can see there's a huge spike in mortgages that have been issued in 2020 as we move from pandemic into endemic, which means that you can safely expect to see the amount of securitization of mortgages going up again in 2021, 2022, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's, a, there's an interesting point here to, to be raised in that, does the banking industry ever learn from its mistakes? The mistakes that it's made in the past? And I think that's very interesting. And perhaps that's something we ought to touch upon in the lecture later on today on financial innovation and ESG, green financing, as I have a view on it. Um, and this is just to give you a, it's a very old graph, but I think it's a telling graph is that, you know, it, it just shows you the, the growth in um, non-interest income. In other words, fees that are being derived from retailing. So France, huge shift in growth in fee related income, but it occurred all over the globe. Is that the shift from banking to something which is a bit boring and the collection of savings, the passing on of savings, and even the, the sort of like the narratives of bankers is that we're just passing on savings from people who are patient, to people that are impatient. It doesn't, it doesn't map with the realities at all. People, we need people to borrow money, whether it be individuals or whether it be firms, we need people to borrow capital, credit, because that's what stimulates the economy. The point here is that what we're making is that banks stimulated it through mass marketing, stimulated and financialized products, not necessarily financing and lending for productive purposes. And in the process, generate huge amounts of fees. And then the investment arms of the banks would actually operate in their own proprietary interests as well. Now, this is the interesting thing here in that, <clears throat> oh, sorry, two or three slides. There's something else that I need to, there's a, there's a very strong link between the investment banks and the retail banks, which I'll explain in a minute. But before we do that, is that it talks about the um, obfuscation of practices in the banking, in the banking sector, movement away from the, how do we know how big or what proportion of, in, of, of income is being made from proprietary trading. And it's very difficult to determine, particularly with the relaxation of the Volcker rule. And what we have seen recently is growth of new players into the market. And these are known as principal trading firms. And <clears throat> just, and it's a, it's a correspondence, but it will be worth looking at. So. As the size of the proprietary trading desks of investment banks decreased, then the number of principal trading firms increased. Remember special interest vehicles? Well, there is nothing to say that a proprietary trading firm is not actually a special interest vehicle of a bank. You'd have to look at its equity structures in terms of who owns the, the money or whether or not it was prop traders that just went and set up independent firms. But there's a new, there's a new player in town to these principal trading firms. Diverse, smaller, non-bank firms that typically deploy automated trading strategies, electronic trading venues, often much faster than speeds and market participants who do not use these techniques. In other words, they are the digital innovators within the financial sphere. And what are they trading in? Well, 50, what is that? 55 to nearly 60% of the FTSE 100 is being bought and sold by principal trading firms. Gilts, which is bonds, 30%. Short, in, short sterling trades, 
Brent, which is oil, nearly 20% of the market. And these will be guys that are engaging in high, fast trading of future contracts, which means that in terms of oil is that future contracts are not oil is not traded over years, but it's just traded on a month's basis because they're doing it very, very quickly because they've got access to the technology in order to be able to do that. So I'm just introducing these into the equation here because it's, they're relatively new and I'm not quite sure what their impact is likely to be, but they're significant and they are new innovators. And I'll make the point now, I think, is that do banks learn? Well, people learn, institutions might not. And as one set of innovators moves on in their career, is that a new set of younger, brighter, better trained, qualified innovators come along and they don't need to learn anything because they've not anything to learn yet. So people will believe that they can innovate and not make the mistakes of their parents or of their older managers. So we've got that done, we've got that nailed. So every time you get a new generation of innovator that comes into the market, digital or financial, is that there is a potential that you can repeat the mistakes of the past. Because they're seeking yields and profits. And the temptation always exists there, or the rewards are always, always exist there too. Oh, lots of chats that have come in. Let's have a look. <clears throat> uh, dibba dibba dum. So where do we go then? Where could um... What do mass marketeers mean? Is it somehow related to mass media? No, mass marketeers means marketing on a big scale. Mass market is like selling to the whole world. Yeah, but on a big scale. How can you sell mortgages and to whom? Well, well, you sell mortgages to a person that wants to buy an house. Well, that's you've sold the mortgage. Well, now I'm exchange of a contract. <clears throat> so if you want to, who is it that's asking me? This is Vladislav. So if you want to buy a house from me and I'm a bank, we now have a contract. Once we've signed that contract, and I, your contract attracts an income fee, I can sell that income to somebody else as a third party because it they're buying a revenue stream. So that's how you sell it. So it could be to banks, could be to all sorts of different groups of people. What's auto on the left graph? Um, cars. Um, <clears throat> what would actually happen to the economy if nobody borrowed money ever? Um, that's a good question. What do you reckon? What would happen? <clears throat> Anybody got any idea? Well, I think in practice is that you've got a volume of money <clears throat> that circulates around the economy. And as long as it continues to turn over, the economy will continue to turn over as well. If, however, you want the economy to grow, then it needs an introduction of more money in the Credit is a good proxy for aggregate demand. Like credit is for demand is a function of the rate of change of credit plus the amount of money that's in circulation and how quick it turns over. So if nobody borrowed any money, <clears throat> as money is withdrawn from the system, is that money needs to be pumped back into the system at an equal or higher rate. So if nobody borrows money, that means that nobody borrows money from the government or from the private sector. Then how do you how do you get more money into the into the economy? Well, the way that you could do that is by the government spends money. So it could be done, but you would be depressing and suppressing the rate of aggregate demand. I would argue. Um, utopian. Mm, not utopian, dystopian, I'd argue. Unrealistic, yeah. Well, well, I don't know about that, actually, because I would argue that people aren't lending money or borrowing money now, not sufficiently, in that a lot of the credit that's being issued goes into markets rather than into productive capacity or into consumption. Um, 
So there are ways, but then you say, well, what if nobody borrowed any money, which would mean space suggests that there is no leveraging or liquidity that's being added to financial markets as well. So yeah, an interesting idea, uh, concept, but I think we've seen what happens when the rate of growth of credit slows down is that economies entered into recession. And Irving Fisher wrote a very interesting theory paper, and I'm not sure whether I've listed it on the Blackboard site, but I feel that I have to now because I've mentioned it, which is known as the debt deflationary spiral, which is as a consequence of a slowdown in the rate of growth of credit, is that economies move into high levels of, have high levels of debt, but then move into deflationary spiral as well. Of course, <clears throat> if there's no debt in the system and people can just live by their earnings, then you still get a continual turnover of money. And that strikes me as almost being like Japan. But it's an interesting question. We might keep, we might come back to that. Banks would lose a large chunk of their profit. Yeah, fine, but what do they do anyway? So am I saying that if no one borrowed money, there will be a global recession? If the rate of credit slows down on a global basis, then yeah, there'd be a global recession. Should we worry about getting notes and all the things you're explaining because it could be difficult to keep up? That's why I'm recording it. What did I tell you at the beginning? Not just Shiraz, but everybody. I said that <coughs> your exam is based upon the lecture slides and the 10 readings that I gave you. So that's where you need to go. So I, there's no need for you to take notes, I don't think, on everything that I'm talking about. you will become, a, it's an introductory course. It's not a course designed to make you experts. It's, an, it's a course which I think should give you enough to be able to have a conversation with somebody else that is less informed with you on an informed basis where you could say and indicate to them where they're going wrong with their conceptualizations of the world and so on and so on and so forth. As an example, a lot of people my age get very worried about public sector debt about government debt well i'm not and i have to explain to them why but i can do that hopefully at the end of the lecture series you might be able to as well so leaving the the um the principal trading firms it's worth pointing out is that banks are shareholder driven too so just as firms are shareholder driven, so banks are shareholder driven, and that has a same similar impact upon the way that banks behave. In other words, why should a bank lend $30 million to Harry, who's got a great idea for a business by opening a production facility in the Philippines, if <clears throat> I say to him, so well, that's a great idea, great plan, when do I get my money back? 15 years, you say? Mm. Well, I could make that 30 million quid back by investing in stock markets over the course of the next few days. So why would I, why would I lend money on that basis? Because I've got to pay shareholders. So banking, investment banking is also run on an explicit profit share basis. Actually, it's not profit share, it's revenue sharing basis between senior bankers and dividend drawing shareholders, which is known as the comp ratio. So in other words, if a banker sells a derivative or an asset for $20 million is that they make a proportion of that as being their bonus. Now the comp ratio has gone down quite a lot, but they're being rewarded on their ability to sell things to other clients and to other investors and so on and so forth. And the profits drive shareholder earnings, but the my sales derive a profit. So I'm bonused upon selling stuff on a comp ratio. So it's a percentage of the amount of turnover, which used to be as high as 20%, if you believe it. Um, and each sale generates a profit because we've demonstrated that in the structuring of the finance and that contributes towards the free um, free cash flow, which benefits shareholders. I've just realised what the time is, so we better get a move on. <clears throat>
Uh, th this is the important thing is this link between investment banks and retail banks. Investment um, retail banks create a mass market for different products, cars, credit cards, mortgages, and so on and so forth, which creates a financialized mass, which provides a feedstock, if you like, or, or we call it a coupon pool, because every asset that somebody buys from one of the retailers provides an income stream, and that income stream goes into a great big pool, yeah, pool of coupons, and that is divvied up and that is the, that, that's what's used as the underlying for the derivative sector. So household debts provides feedstock, the underlying for the derivatives that we've been talking about. And the amount of debt or the amount of borrowings that the household sector is more than 50% of total, meaning that there is a ginormous amount of assets that can be utilized in order to be able to drive the derivative sector, out of which investment bankers make bonuses based upon a comp ratio and pass their earnings on to shareholders, financialized banks. It is a rapacious model. So this is just a, a question to ask you as a reflective question before we, we move towards the end here, is that, you can see that the, from the Economist Food Index is that the price of food has gone up dramatically in the last few years. And yet food is a commodity, which is traded by derivatives on over-the-counter contracts or through exchanges. And the question that I ask is that while some make millions from trading food, millions just don't have sufficient access to it. So even though the food or the derivative may have reduced the risk to those that the counterparties in it and made the market efficient. Is the market working to the extent that it ought to be doing? And I'll just leave you with that one because I'll extend that question later on this afternoon at quarter past four when we'll talk about exchange traded funds and environmental sustainable and governance issues and green financing.